Welcome to the third installment of the Opportunities and What You Need to Know Now series in partnership with SFU Alumni Relations, BD School of Business, Career and Volunteer Services, and Work Integrated Learning. Today we're pleased to present to you the Entrepreneurship Panel of Experts. My name is Natalia Soloshenko and I'm the Manager of the Undergraduate Careers at BD School of Business. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is a traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Kwikwetlem nations. Along with our panelists, I'm joined today by Dr. Sarah Lubick, who will be moderating the panel discussion. Welcome, Sarah, and the Entrepreneurship Expert Panelists. Thank you, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I am Sarah Lubick. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship for SFU, which means if it has to do with entrepreneurship, um, mindset creation and education, I'm probably involved somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also the executive director of the Charles Chang Institute for Entrepreneurship, which is the interdisciplinary home of all things entrepreneurial mindset at SFU, working with all the different disciplines and all of the different incubators at SFU, uh, part of SFU Innovates, which is SFU's larger innovation strategy. So today's panel is inspired by the growing need and realization of our community um, that entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial mindset is increasingly important. Uh, we've seen, above all things in this time, adaptability and the ability to create your own opportunities and create your own jobs has become more and more important. And we have with us today some amazing people who have done just that, um, sometimes several times. Um, we have with us Ben Britton, who is an alum, SFU alum of the Ida to Eye Invention Innovation Program, which for anyone who is a scientist uh, out there today, we are currently recruiting a cohort of that and there is funding available. Um, ben is also uh, a scientist um, from the chemistry department. Uh, we have Farah Saad, who is an alumni from the Beatty School of Business, um, founder of Be Calm. Uh, we have Jeff Achinlik, who is not SFU technically, but has been adopted as one of our experts and is part of the family, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO of Claris Healthcare. And we have Christina Wong, who is a SFU Venture Connection client currently, and she is also an alumni of the Arts and Social Sciences faculty uh, in psychology, I believe. And she is the founder of Employee to Empower. And I realized I got through um, Ben's credentials and didn't say his company is Ionomer Innovations. Um, and so we have with us science background, art background, business background, helping sustainable innovation, um, uh, gerontology and caring for our senior population. Christina works in helping people in the downtown east side. And Farah is keeping us all calm during these crazy times. Uh, so I'm going to, so there's lots of inspiration for everybody. It's very important to note that entrepreneurship SFU is something that is for absolutely everyone, whether you are going to be your own boss, whether you're going to work in a corporation, government, private sector, social innovation, and for every discipline. And so today we're going to get to know and be inspired by these cool people. So I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to briefly tell us their story whether you originally planned to be an entrepreneur and how you got into this in the first place. So why don't I start with the order that's on my screen. So Ben, do you mind starting us off? Sure, absolutely. I, uh, I guess I've always been self-employed. I was a tutor through all of my undergraduate, uh, through uh, my PhD. And uh, I always had an idea to start a chemistry company as a means of seizing the means of production, but I didn't really have a concrete vision uh, for quite some time. So in, in 2012, I joined the lab of uh, Professor Stephen Holdcroft in the chemistry department on a project that was dedicated to materials that nobody thought could work after 25 years of failure, uh, by, including by major industry leaders like BASF and Gore and others. And uh, really this effort only existed in academia since 2005. Um, I was uh, the sole electrochemist, and there was uh, about a dozen synthesis providing me materials, and I got to see firsthand that uh, what we were doing was actually setting records and so solving problems that existed for literally decades. And at that point, when we achieved the performances and consistencies in lifetimes that we'd only dreamed about, uh, it gave me the impetus to learn about technology commercialization, uh, 
proposed to my co-founders and uh, ultimately uh, joined the Idea to Make Innovation program. And uh, from there, I pursued the licensing agreement and uh, ultimately raised uh, venture funding in 2017 and have been going ever since pursuing the vision then. Thank you so much, Ben. And Ben is also humble, but has not to told us that he is now the winner and Ionomer is the winner of many international awards because of the impact that they have made and are poised to make. Um, Farah, do you mind if I follow up with you? Sure. Um, so I actually never thought I would be an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, this kind of came about in 2016. Um, I thought about always starting a social enterprise. I just didn't know what it would look like. Um, it was just during my travels that I set out with the intention of doing something around a social enterprise. It turned into more of an entrepreneurship thing and starting my own business. Um, and prior to that, honestly, it was, I just never, prior to that, I was very comfortable with the corporate lifestyle and, you know, working the nine to five. That's having the two week paycheck. And it just kind of changed because I had a burnout myself. And that's when I really started thinking about life and what do I really want and what do I really value. And, um, and in, that, in that, I guess, self-reflection is when I decided to actually do pursue um, my own business, be calm. That is a fantastic reason. Deciding to pursue your passions through your own business is something I'm sure there's many people in this audience who are thinking about doing. Jeff, do you mind if I go to you next? Sure. Yeah. So uh, when I graduated from uh, that other university out on the end of Point Grey in 1981, I probably didn't even know. Like, I don't. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. I don't think I knew the word. Uh, I understood that you got your university degree and then you went and worked for a company, and uh, that's the way the world worked. And, Somewhere along the line, I realized I was working for idiots. No, I shouldn't say that. I was uh, working in companies that I didn't think had a great future. And finally, uh, in 1997, uh, the company I was working for decided to relocate to some place called Mississauga, which is somewhere out there. Uh, I'm a fifth generation British Columbia, so that was not computing. And so I decided, hey, you know what? I should take some of these ideas I've got and start my own business. And suddenly I discovered I was an entrepreneur. And and so I really backed into it. I, uh, it wasn't a life goal or anything like that. It just kind of happened to me. Very cool. And Christina. Hello. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Imploding Power. And my story actually began when I was a teenager. So um, I, to answer Sarah's question, so I don't ramble on and on. Uh, I never thought I would be an entrepreneur. I kind of fell into it. I did know that I wanted to be involved in the social services industry since I was 14 and I am 27 now. So uh, I really had a chance to connect with some of the residents living in our own backyard in the East Side community and really took the time to listen in terms of how we can best support people in the long term versus the short term. A lot of uh, the current nonprofits and charities um, are doing amazing work with the short term outcomes and I think what we were hearing from the residents was uh, exploring long term support and that was around um, and how we want to do that was the means to get there was mentorship and microloans. So I would say before this whole journey started, I was in, I would like for a story, I was also in the corporate world. So I worked um, at an organization, um, it was nine to five. Actually it wasn't nine to five, it was like more like nine to seven or eight. It was more so the event planning life where we, I barely had any time to, you know, continue volunteering in the downtown Isla like I always had. and I. I felt like something was missing. And to be honest, it was due to just frustration of, okay, it sounds like I'm not really thriving in terms of being in a structured work style. So why not just take everything that I've learned and uh, start a charity? Um, so Sarah was actually one of the first people that I sat down with <laughs> after I started and I didn't really know what I was doing because I didn't have a background in business, but uh, she was really um, awesome in terms of being a mentor and just really listened and I think Finding mentors is probably something I'll get into later, um, but definitely um, it wasn't like a lifetime goal to be an entrepreneur. I fell into it, so it was fun. It is fun. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of people who, when we speak to our alumni, who are called call themselves accidental entrepreneurs. The sort of this was well, not my life goal, but 
turns out this is how I get what I want or how I get to pursue my dreams. So it's very exciting that we have people coming at this from a lot of different angles. So I know that one of the questions that comes up a lot around entrepreneurship centers around security. And one of the pieces of the entrepreneurial mindset is seeing risk differently and being more secure with risk when it's in your own hands versus someone else's hands. And more now than ever, we're seeing job security looking like being able to create your own opportunities rather than being dependent on other people. Um, but one of the questions that always comes up is, when did you turn this from a side hustle, taking the jump into having this be a full-time business? What was the tipping point for you? Christina, do you mind if I ask you first? Didn't expect to be called on first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, don't make it me. <laughs> I'm an instructor sometimes, I gotta surprise you. Yeah. Well, you're good at that. Uh, so when the question was when I went from side hustle to, uh, well, I don't know if I can quite, I think I have a different experience because I didn't really, it wasn't quite a side hustle. Well, I guess it was because, okay, I get it, I got it, I got it. I had to think a little bit. So 20, I think in 2018, we incorporated and um, clearly, you know, it was a, a startup charity. We were still building, you know, the foundation of the organization. So I would say I, I did have to work uh, five different contract jobs to, to make ends meet. And I think the pivotal point where um, it became like a side hustle to full time was when we started getting some funders um, and partners on board who really believed in the organization and had um, offered to compensate um, a part of my pay. So it was through to, I would say it's through community and building a group of really strong, fierce supporters who um, are willing to kind of help you get to the next step. Um, but I would say that was kind of the transition. It's an interesting question, Sarah, because I never thought it'd be a side hustle. It was always kind of working towards a step to kind of make it turn into a full-time. That was my goal. Um, so does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. I realize I, I gave you guys the first question in an awkward way because I asked you a question and asked you to tell your backstory but I'm not sure everyone here is familiar with Employee to Empower. So do you mind taking your quick 30 second pitch of what Employee to Empower actually is? Okay, I'll try my best. Uh, so Employee to Empower is a registered charity. We support residents in Vancouver's downtown east side by providing access to development and entrepreneurial resources. So what that looks like is business mentorship, microloans, and just really providing that community of supporters um, to empower people's self-confidence first and foremost to jumpstart their business. Um, and uh, that's us. We've been around for almost three years now. So it's been an exciting ride. I think that was 20 seconds. Oh. Very well done. I will bring you in next time I teach pitching. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so I'm just going back now in the order that's on my screen. So um, Jeff, do you mind talking a little bit about when you decided you were going to be a full-time entrepreneur? And also, do you mind giving us a quick um, background on what Claris is? I have another question about that, that in the next go, but it might be okay. good to all right, so Claris is a uh, platform for the delivery of care into the homes, particularly of seniors and isolated seniors. We can do things like give them a social contact with their family and friends. We can do remote patient monitoring so their physicians can keep track of them, and we can help coach them through acute interventions like surgery. Uh, oddly enough, uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in looking after seniors who are isolated in their own home these days, so we're in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. That's that. In terms of, did I do entrepreneurship as a side hustle? No, I jumped right into the deep end of the pool. As I said, that you know, company I was working for moved to Mississauga and I wasn't about to do that. So the next day I had a mortgage and no job, you know, and that, that was sort of now or never. I co-founded the company with the world's most brilliant salesman, which was the smartest move I ever made because he was able to start generating revenue basically by promising that we could do anything, <laughs> you know, starting to build <laughs> for it. So. <laughs> All the more reason to have an interdisciplinary team. Yes. Partner with very clever people. Now, how about you, Farah? How did you jump in? Well, how, how did BCOM start? And when did it become more than passion? Yeah. Um, so BCOM actually came about just through actually people t asking me to start it. Um, so backstory not to get into it too much but i quit my corporate job in 2016 i decided to um, actually just travel to figure out what i really wanted to do 
And in between those travels, I discovered mindfulness and meditation. So when I came back to Canada, I started sharing with people everything that I learned, everything that I was implementing into my life. And people started, you know, asking, hey, why don't you start offering more of this? Why don't you start coaching? Um, and I really wanted to make a difference in the, uh, the workplace just because I used to be part of that corporate world. I had my burnout there and I felt like, you know, that's something I really understood well and I really wanted to um, make a shift in. So that's where BCom came about. BCom is a mindfulness consulting agency. We offer uh, workshops around stress and anxiety management, integrating wellness in the workplace as well. And, um, and you know, I also do a lot of individual coaching as well. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of the story. As for, did it, was it ever a side hustle? No, I actually, you know, I, it was never a side hustle. As I mentioned, when I went traveling, I came back and the intention was I was either going to go back to a full-time job or start my own business. And at the time, everyone just kept pushing me to start my own business because I talked so much about it um, leading up to it that I decided to take the plunge and just see, you know, how it does. And it's been two years now. So um, I incorporated in 2018 and um, yeah, that's kind of my story. Fantastic. So everyone jumping into the deep end. And Ben, how are you? I know that I know your story and you were a side hustle for a little while, but not for very long. I don't know. I, I was uh, doing my PhD and the company simultaneously. And I gave myself uh, three months to write my thesis, but I paralyzed my arm <laughs> in, a, in an odd accident that uh, reversed itself, thankfully, but I couldn't write my thesis properly. So I, uh, yeah, I raised in April of 2017 and didn't defend my PhD until November of 2018, even though I spent the day in the lab in the interim between the two. So uh, write your PhD first. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Because, yeah, the second you raise funding, it's a different story. Yeah, I was a postdoc when I did my own, so I remember that being maybe not the best choice I've ever made as far as planning was. <laughs> Very good. Now, we're starting to get some questions around being overwhelmed and around um, uh, where do you begin? And I think some of that it is embedded in the current situation. So can I ask you, um, lots of businesses and jobs have been disrupted in the COVID situation and that's leading to more and more interest in entrepreneurship. How has this been for you? And what have you done to, to pivot to adapt and to stay calm in the meantime? It feels like that was setting it up for you to be the first person to talk about it. Sorry, me? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah, honestly, uh, I'm still pivoting. I'll be honest. Um, I'm still, um, so all of my workshops were in person. So when this COVID situation hit, I had to figure out a new plan and figure out how am I going to switch my focus. Um, so I did move everything online. So there are webinars now instead of in-person workshops. The great thing about COVID was um, it gave me an opportunity to work with international clients that I might not have been able to do prior just because they were more open now to doing a webinar and doing a workshop over Zoom versus in person. So there are some great opportunities as well that way. Sorry, the other question you asked was how, like, sorry, can you repeat? There was another part of that question that I missed, I know I did. <laughs> no, it, it, I, I think I asked the same question in a couple different ways. So it really was, how did you adapt and what's come about in COVID? So you totally answered the question. Okay, awesome, okay, all right. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I wanted to follow on that question with you because I also remember we had just started COVID. You had come and spoke, spoke into my eye to eye class um, and business was actually taking off for you and you told a really lovely story. Um, about uh, a gentleman who was using the um, using your device and loved it so much um, that they were having trouble finding it. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling that story briefly. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, so we have this device for uh, social contact for seniors. And this was a, a fellow with, uh, uh, you know, getting on to be late stage dementia, whose son was in California and didn't get a chance to see him very often. One of the features that we can do with this thing is incredibly easy video chat, where the senior doesn't have to do anything. The call just comes in and they can video chat. And uh, we had this place, this uh, product in 
this gentleman's home. And one day we got a call from his caregiver saying that unfortunately the device had disappeared and they didn't know where it had gone. And, and you know, we detected that the battery had gone dead and this was you know, quite upsetting. And finally we got a phone call back from the caregiver saying we found it. The uh, gentleman was curled up in his bed hugging the, the tablet computer because he'd seen his son on it. That's why we do this. That's, uh, that's the why of the company is having that kind of impact on people. Um, I'm going to answer your other question too, Sarah, because uh, you know, uh, COVID came out of the blue for us as much as anybody else, but we had the opposite problem to most people that between uh, March and April, the sales of, of our main product went up by 20 times. And you know, you don't plan for things like that. <laughs> you know, it's a nice problem to have, as they say, but it's still a problem. And being able to respond quickly and you know not uh, dive into a blind panic is uh, is one of the keys for entrepreneurship. Is you just kind of take it a step at a time and, and deal with these things. So you you never know where the surprise is going to come from. The only thing I can guarantee you is that there's going to be a surprise coming. Yep, absolutely. This is one of the things I hear with people in, in the innovation entrepreneurship space all of the time. Is that really the only thing you know is that you don't know what's about to happen, right, and exactly. you just have to be ready for it and believe in yourself to do it. Now, I, I realized I didn't actually do this on purpose, but the panel we've assembled are actually all people who are addressing a big social, quite significant social challenges with the companies that they've started between uh, climate change, uh, mental health, downtown east side, senior care. And so um, you have a in, very interesting perspective because you would think that these kind of things that we know humans depend on, um, those are things actually get more important in times like this. And so I'm, I'm curious, um, let's start with Ben at this case. Um, how did you, how do you adapt? Have you seen any changes going on in the clean energy space through COVID? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, the, Nobody apart from Germany has really announced the financial stimulus packages on the back of this, but the clean energy economy is coming faster because of this. So there may be uh, troubles in many industries, but uh, Germany committed to 8% uh, of their total recovery funds uh, purely to hydrogen technology, uh, which is uh, more or less equaled all of the funding through all of history in every other nation in one shot. So. <laughs> Uh, the clean energy economy is coming years faster than as a result of that. So that's a sort of long-term uh, positive. I mean, the COVID could have been disastrous for my company, but we had already set up a supply chain that was robust and had uh, enough vision to plan ahead. And, you know, we've been doing just fine through this process. And uh, one funny uh, serendipitous thing is we may have a, a medical spin-up we have a universal antimicrobial coating that has sat on the shelf for two years because I thought it was really nifty out of a water treatment uh, thing that I went to. And it's got us listed as a essential business in the, and a finalist on a couple major uh, antimicrobial challenge type programs, uh, including with the National Research Center. Hopefully this goes through. We're still, uh, we're still waiting for these, but it's uh, another way we adapt is to look uh, into the list of things you can do with a platform technology. Excellent, excellent adaptability. And the, the geeky scientist in me wants to study that as a case study, but I will transition, I will like still my inner geek and ask a question to Christina, because your, your uh, experience with COVID has been a little different and you've had to create, you found out you were gonna have to create uh, another offering for your community. So do you mind talking about that a little? Oh yeah. Well, Charity World, you know, we really rely on funding so that we can continue to make the impact that we want to make in the community. So in the beginning, we got, I felt like we were going on a really smooth train ride and then we got derailed, um, which was a normal thing in, in the charitable sector. Um, but, you know, I, I think what really helped with the adapt process was really listening again because what we were noticing was we're going to be affected threefold in the downtown East community whether that's physical mental um phys physically economically and emotionally and i believe that people uh in this in the east side community will be affected the most socially 
socially or emotionally. And you know, isolation is something that isn't just happened, that doesn't just happen in the downtown east side, it also happens outside. And so we were thinking, well, how can we, I wonder if there's a way that uh, employer and power can adapt to help people stay socially connected in a way that's safe as well as empowering the strengths of the entrepreneurs in our program. And so um, how that came about was, I think uh, the first stage was just to really validate the people in a program to reassure them that we're not leaving them. Because a lot of people experience you know, depression and anxiety and they really rely on the in-person kind of mentorship sessions to, to kind of uh, get their energy. So when, at first when we weren't allowed to see them, we definitely had to you know, just really call one-on-one -on -one and do those uh, mental health check-ins. Um, and then following that, um, I think how the, how the new program came about as a result of COVID-19 was actually from uh, an elderly grandma that I had met who was introduced to me through a program member. And I remember the story was she knew someone who was um, 91, uh, had no family, no Wi-Fi, and she was also immunocompromised. She had asthma. And um, she was unable to basically go out and even buy groceries. Um, so the program member um, in, asked me if I could go drop off some groceries for her. And so when I did drop it off for her, I spoke to her through the door. Um, and there was just some dialogue around wanting some social connection during this time. And so there, like, we looked at our organization and looked at the strengths of the people and um, started the Call to Empower program where we mobilized the entrepreneurs in our program to actually be the peers to call um, socially isolated residents to kind of be that, like, be that, uh, it's like a healing, it's a symbiotic healing experience because peers, by definition, um, are people who have lived experience. Um, it's much higher relational empathy when you talk to someone who's also a resident. So we thought, why don't we raise some money and give them honorariums to be the ones to go out there and make that social change because they are fully capable and confident. Um, so I know it was a little long, but that was kind of the story of how it happened. And now we've been supporting uh, 20 plus peers in the community and it's just been so awesome. Although we did have one client ask for uh, one of the peers out on a date, but we had to teach boundaries <laughs> at that time. So that's kind of how we adapted, just really listening. Um, and uh, yeah, listening was probably the best part. Yeah, I think listening, listening to the changing needs of the people you're serving is definitely an incredibly important part. Um, and speaking of people who listen to you, one of the other questions that we have going here is, um, where do you find support to do things like this? And I, I promise I'm not trying to start a leading question for those of you who work with me. But where are you finding, where do you find support? And um, have you had access to other support or tips, um, particularly right now? So Ben, do you mind if I start with you? Uh, so we raise support from local angel investors. Um, and this came out of a long process of, uh, I guess, two years of talking with angel investors. So it was a, a community effort with uh, multiple uh, mentors out of the SFU community, including uh, the main mentor I had was a fellow named Jim Derbyshire, who's a uh, very involved with Venture Labs and ultimately became our board chair. And uh, he was instrumental in, in helping us find the relevant resources. Um, he is really the guy who brought Wi-Fi to the world along with my CEO and VP of Ops. So it's, uh, you know, people, there, there are people who have done amazing things in this world who can help you even if your problem is incredibly obscure. So. That's, that's fabulous. And I, I wanted to point out, Ben, sorry for using you as a case study again, but um, Venture Connection is the early stage incubator at SFU. And that is also a place to go and get uh, support for the, so those of you who are um, students or alumni or faculty in the audience, it's free. <laughs> um, and Christina put up her hand, so I guess I'll go there next because she is a current client. I was, I was actually saying woo, but then I was on mute. So you probably oh, thought sure. I was raising my hand, but I am a very, very proud Venture Connection client. Um, they, I don't know if this is like a shameless plug, but they, <laughs> they supported us with um, just even on the social, social and emotional side of just really pushing us to believe in ourselves and just try it and that you can get through what it is, um, all the challenges you have ahead of you, as well as even providing like mentorship, um, workshops, and just like a really strong community of people who have your back this is just really what it is so anybody out there should go check out venture connection because 
they have your back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Uh, speaking of people who provided support at Venture Connections, and Farrah, you've actually done a workshop there, but I don't know who supports you. So where have you been able to find support? Yeah, so um, I actually went the completely different route. I went through Work BC um, just because um, after coming back, because I'd been on EI, they were able to, I found out they have a bunch of programs as well. And um, so they actually have a lot of programs for people under 30, but they also, I didn't fit into that <laughs> group. So there's also other programs for people over that age group that, you know, if you fit certain things, if you have been on EI, um, you know, there, it shows that technically you can't go back to your job for whatever reason. Um, there are programs out there that will help you start your own business. So it's very similar to SFU Venture Connections. I know SFU Venture Connections, it, it's a little bit, you know, it is for SFU students and there is a little bit of um, certain, you know, um, I guess criteria that you have to meet. So if you don't, there are other programs. I also want, I've heard about this, there's League of Innovators as well. Um, there's programs like Next 36. There's, I mean, there's a lot out there. If you just research, you know, programs to help with starting your own business. Uh, but specifically for me, I went through WorkBC and they were able to assist me from writing a business plan to actually, you know, um, helping me find my target market to actually then um, being able to market it. And it was really well done. So it was a really good program. Awesome. Those are really helpful. And Jeff, I, I know also know you more in the context of you being the support rather than you getting support. So do you mind uh, telling us a little bit about where you get your help? Yeah, so uh, I, I have to tell my entrepreneur story, Sarah, because it's so important to this question. That, uh, when I first launched that company in 1997, I flew out to the headquarters of this company that was moving us out to Mississauga, went into the chief financial officer's office and said, Mr. Phillips, you have a very serious problem because I'm not moving to Mississauga and you're going to have to pay me a big whack of severance, which was not true. And I said, what I want to do is I want your company to give me rights to this technology. and I'm going to start my own business. And he uh, had every right to throw me out of the office. He was 64 years old. His company was, that he was a founder of, by the way, was worth, say, a billion dollars by that time. And instead of tossing me out, he put his feet up on the desk and said, I, I love entrepreneurs. I was the guy who started this company. I was the one that had to go to the bank and beg for enough money to meet payroll on Friday. And oh, another guy like you come in once and want to start a company and his company's worth a lot of money now. How much do you need? Was his question. That was my first exposure to a true entrepreneur. And this is an important lesson to everybody here. A successful entrepreneur loves nothing more than to turn around and help you become a success too. If you're passionate about an idea that you've got, any successful entrepreneur will sit down and offer you advice and direction and suggestions and ideas and solutions and contacts for the price of a cup of coffee or less. And I'm not kidding. If you go out there and you've got, if you've got an idea and you're passionate about it, there's no problem at all finding people who will sit down and give you advice. If you're trying to you know, do it off the back of your, your desk and not you know, get really serious about it, you're probably not gonna be very successful, but otherwise, people like me have got all the time in the world for you. It's a great ride to be a successful entrepreneur. It's an amazing ride, and I'd love you all to have the same ride. So if I can help, I'll help. And that's how I got started, and I know that there's lots of people out there like me who are willing to give the time to, to help you out, like uh, Jim Derbyshire, for example. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, one of the other questions that we have here that I just accidentally scrolled by is we know this sounds like a very exciting ride right now. We've talked about all of the positives. This can also be overwhelming. So what do you do when you find yourself overwhelmed? I'm just looking at who is actually looking at the camera. Farah, can I start with you? Well, I feel like because my business is around, uh, you know, making sure people are mindful, I have to practice what I preach. Uh, so I am very mindful about that. Um, so to be honest, like when this COVID hit, I'll give an example because I feel like with COVID, everything has changed and the world has changed. Um, the first month was hard. I, there was a lot of, you know, days where I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> like this is, 
you know, um, will my business survive? I went through all of those fears and I went through all of those days, which were, you know, I had Netflix, uh, I binge watched Netflix and I ate my chocolate and I sat there <laughs> worried. Um, I think I even texted Sarah at one point and she's like, how are you doing? And I'm like, ah, not so good right now. And I think there was this pivotal point where I think, um, honestly, you know, I just, I knew I will survive and I just thought, okay, what can I do right now in this moment to help? And um, so I just focused on giving back at the time and I decided doing these mindfulness sessions just open to anyone in the world uh, because you know I realized having go going through it myself and having the tools and I was having a hard time with it I could only imagine what other, other people were going through so what I do now is um, I'm very mindful of taking my weekends off and not working um, there are a few exceptions of course but I'm very mindful of not working on weekends um, I do, I don't have a set schedule because sometimes I do work better and have these great ideas at 2 a.m. And so I've accepted that is my new routine. Um, but I do go for nature walks and I highly recommend just, you know, finding what works for you. For me, being in nature, I find it really calming. So I do that. Um, I also, you know, try to eat really well. So eating really well is really important. I know, you know, it's okay to have days where you eat fast food, but try to eat healthy, drink lots of water. It does have an impact on your body and how you feel. Um, and I do try to, you know, I'm struggling with this right now, but trying to shut off my screen an hour before I go to sleep. Um, I notice the difference, the days I do it versus the days I don't. Um, and, I, and I'll be honest, I'm struggling with sleeping again right now. Like I, I've been really, um, I have been struggling the last couple of days and, and I've just kind of accepted it. And, um, and, you know, I do the best that I can, but honestly, I think everyone needs to just remember to do your best, whatever that looks like right now. And, you know, that's going to change daily and be okay with that. Um, but that's some of the things that I'm doing right now. And I hope that helps and be compassionate and kind to yourself. That's the one thing I've really learned to be more compassionate to ourselves. You know, I, I think we're always so nice to everyone else and we're always giving out all the supportive advice, but how often do we apply that advice our, ourselves? And I'm guilty of that. You know, I'll, I'll tell my good friends to do certain things and then I don't practice it myself. So um, it's very important to practice what we preach. So, yeah. That is so well said. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very guilty of that myself. So thank you for that. Um, does anyone want to follow that one up? I'll follow that one up. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's fantastic advice. Uh, uh, don't forget to look after yourself and put yourself first in terms of your health and your well-being because if you fail then everyone else that's depending on you fails so incredibly important to take that time but there is one very simple tip that my elder brother who's run companies a thousand times bigger than anything I've ever done gave me years and years ago I asked him how he managed to cope with just this overwhelming amount of stuff that was coming into him every day and he said Every morning I get up and I stop for a minute and I think, what is the one thing I can do today that will move the company forward? And he says, then I do that one thing. And if I finish that one thing, then I can worry about a few other details, but I know that I've moved the company forward. He says, that just kind of lowers the, the constant roar and there's always more work to do than you've got time for. But if you can look at it and say, I made a step that moved the company forward, then you're getting somewhere. And it just kind of takes that whole negative energy away. So it works for me. That's such good advice. It's so easy to get wrapped up in all the little things and in the, the things that don't matter. Because I remember someone telling me, it doesn't matter if your inbox is empty, if you just spent the entire day answering things that don't matter. Correct, exactly. Yes. Christina, you wanna? I actually that? raised my hand this time. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't just cheering by myself. Um, I, I, I think these are, uh, I really relate to both of what uh, Jeff and Farah are saying. The compassion piece is a really interesting one. Um, I think, you know, growing up, sometimes we're taught to have that critical voice towards ourselves, whether we learned it from like maybe an incident that our friends said to us or our parents said to us. So practicing that self-compassion, I think is like the first and foremost step when any type of emotion kind of comes in, into, your, into your mind. Um, I would say one thing that helps me when I feel really overwhelmed is just uh, not tying my productivity to my worth. So sometimes people feel like there's this agreement 
subconscious agreement that we make with ourselves that like the more we do, the more worthy we are. Um, and understanding that your worth also falls out, like lies outside of the business. Of course, granted, there are nights where you kind of have to, you know, chug a couple coffees and push, push through for the night. Right. But I think sometimes like that mental hack helps me feel less overwhelmed. Um, so that's just something that I wanted to follow up on because it kind of came up while you guys were speaking. So important. Absolutely. How about you, Ben? Uh, you know, so many good points to follow on. Uh, I think the big one for me was not tying my identity to the success of my company. It's really easy because it was all I thought about six years before I founded the company. And then, you know, it just sort of blended into one, but you know, you go for working. Yeah, I, I overwork a lot, but I, I have made a good point of uh, really setting activities and things to, to have a good break and have a sort of mental gap from day to day and from activity to activity. and. I was going to lead with, I stab people, but that could have come across wrong. I, I do fencing uh, and <laughs> I <took> the, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's my I, advice, great advice from the other panelists. I, I love that particularly because I knew that you did fencing, but I forgot. And so I was trying to go, why would that have been a thing Ben would say? <laughs> totally get it. It makes so much more sense uh, with the context. And I think these are all such important and strong points. I think one of the, when I look back at some of the best advice I've ever gotten for life, um, one of our associate deans, Olga Volkoff, uh, told me schedule fun first. It's like whatever goes into your schedule first is something that stays there is what you value. So your family, fun, things that allow you to de-stress. Make sure that those go in as well as everything business related that you have to do. But speaking of uh, chilling people out who are related to your business. One of the questions that we have is how do you s provide your investors, your employees, if you have them, the community members, the people you depend on, um, a sense of security when things are going are starting to get unpredictable. So in situations like this where, you know, everything that you planned is probably changing around, how do you make sure the people who came on that journey with you feel secure too? Anyone want to take that one first? Yeah, I'll start with that one, Sarah. One of the first things is to uh, always appreciate that you're dealing with adults, intelligent adults. Don't try to hide things from them. Don't try to you know, paint a picture that isn't true. Be honest and transparent with them and demonstrate to them again and again that you're in it just as deeply or even more deeply than they are that you're committed to the success of the company and you're going to take the blows that, that uh, come along. You know, if, if it, you know, people need to be, uh, have their salary cut back, be the first one to take the salary cut, not the last. If people need to be laid off, make sure that you show your pain and it, it should be real pain if you have to let people go. You know, breaking up your team is one of the hardest things ever to do. But the primary thing is, be honest and be open about the challenges that the company faces, is facing and be honest and open about what you intend to do to address them. If you have a team that is committed to you and trusts you, they'll stick it out. And I've had to do that and it has worked. That's, that's so important. I think building on someone, some of the points that were raised when talking about taking care of yourself, sometimes that, that sort of radical honesty of let's, let's tell people what's actually happening and be clear about it, whether it's with you or your company is so important. Um, Farah, you're nodding along a little bit. So do you have more to add to that? Honestly, I think Jeff said it well. I had a very similar point. Um, I'm pretty fortunate that my company is small enough so it doesn't impact a lot of people. Um, and yes, I, I see that as a blessing right now because <laughs> I know the bigger it is, the more people that are reporting to you. And, and I, I think Jeff's point just sums it up so well. Um, the few people that are, you know, involved with me, I've, I've just been honest with them. And, and, you know, I've, I've even with my clients, you know, um, I have a very open, honest relationship with them. And I'm, and I think they appreciate that from what I've seen and, of course, um, you know, I think it's a trying time for everyone and we're all just figuring it out as we go. And I think, um, 
I think, you know, this is where authenticity is really important. And uh, that's a big value of mine. So I really try to be authentic with everything I do and everything I say. So I think, you know, it's very important to be authentic right now. Yeah, absolutely true. Ben, how about you? You have, um, you're in the midst of a fast growing company saving the world with lots of investors. So how are you and growing employee base? How's right. that work for you? Well, we were fortunate that we raised our last fund in December of this past year. So we have uh, runway through middle of next year, which is about the perfect timeline. Uh, but yeah, we were in the middle of a series A. We even have uh, a term sheet in and then uh, COVID has delayed this somewhat, but you know, it's, uh, I would say at least in the clean tech sector, it's important to raise for multiple years of runway at a time, uh, not just because it's prudent and it gives uh, an ability to hire better talent and things like that because you can have some security, but also the way that Canadian grant mechanisms work. If you can raise for three years, you can leverage that far better than if you raise in six or six month intervals, which I did early on, or you know even year intervals, which is the more prevailing uh, what you should do. So yeah, having that long-term trajectory, especially in, in an industry where the design cycles are long and uh, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, we can, uh, the, the good news is it didn't push our long-term revenue out any and it maybe it, it will enhance it. It's just, it's a, a, an odd place to be for that. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And that's good advice for anyone starting any kind of business is give yourself enough runway. And in fact, often a little bit more runway than you expect. Because challenges come up. <laughs> challenges come up. I know that I, I, I talked about all my SFU positions, but for those of you who don't know me, I do have um, a hardware tech company in, in the UK. Um, and I learned, definitely learned the hard way with our first round that um, if something's going to break, it will be a very expensive something. And so if you do not have some contingency, um, you will build it in the next round, but it will be scary at the beginning. Um, Christina, I know that you created, we already talked about what you created for your community in the face of COVID to make them feel better, but was there anything else you wanted to add to that point? Well, uh, in, in charity world, there's no investors, but there, there are donors and there's stakeholders and, and volunteers, I would say. So our approach was asking, making sure that they felt like they had input as well. We're a very small, tight-knit team and... <laughs> what we just had a lot of brainstorm sessions of like, you know, here's where we see the risk and like, what are some ideas that we have and everybody kind of contributes to the table. So that was a very collaborative discussion that made people feel that, you know, this, again, the authenticity of just being a bit open and communicative uh, as well as a little bit vulnerable too, but like vulnerable with an actual plan. <laughs> just like, you know, like these are the areas and this is how, this is how I'd like to approach it. So at least people know that you have a plan. Um, so I think that's mainly been our approach in kind of keeping people in the loop as well as feeling safe as well. I think that's critically important. Now I'm, we're, we're running short on the, the formal part, but I have one more question and I want to put it into a, um, a positive inspiration light for the last question. So one of ours has been, as I say that every single question has been super inspiring for me. So thank you very much. But for the being an entrepreneur inspiring question, someone had asked, how do you get your first Someone asked your first hundred um, clients, but you know, for a lot of people, the most important thing is the first one or the first one, two, three. So how did you go about getting your first, your first client and your first couple of clients? Or I guess for Christina, I spoke the people you work with and your funders. So do you mind starting? The question was, how did I get my first funder slash entrepreneur? First your first entrepreneur. Okay. You started with a street store. As as the as a funder, or well, that was your first initiative, wasn't it? Ah, uh, yes, yes. The start off with the story of the street store being an annual event. Uh, it was like a pop up clothing store for for people in need, and we did it every Christmas. And it was essentially a dignified shopping experience where people can choose what they want and need uh, at no cost. So. That was kind of the, the backstory of it. And it gave me a lot of time to talk to thousands of residents and just understand, you know, what are the barriers that they face and uh, what are some things that are missing in the community. So that really helped us build a strong backbone to jumpstart into the charity of Important Power. Streets are 
evolved into employment power. Um, and I would say first, whew, first client, my, my brain's going on a journey right now. Um, I would say it took a lot of emotional courage to just go out and talk to people. Um, going to the spaces where low-income entrepreneurs in the down and east side would sell their work and just, I don't know, buying a couple things too and striking up a conversation and really just taking the time to build rapport um, in a way that's open and honest and sincere. Uh, and that, that was, you know, I just kept going back. I kept, they have a lot of, uh, I'm not sure if anyone has ever been to the street market um, on uh, 57 West Hastings, but there are a lot of uh, talented entrepreneurs there who just uh, resell certain things and you go there sometimes and you buy things that you don't need. Um, but definitely uh, after a couple interactions, um, one of the entrepreneurs uh, who is in our program today asked for some support with computer. He wanted to learn computer to sell um, his stuff online. And we said, cool. Uh, let's go to the SFU Harbor Center Library because I'm an alumni and I can use computers for free still. <laughs> and uh, I can teach you computer there. Um, and so that's kind of how it all, all blossomed in terms of client. Um, I would say Funder. Funder was a pretty exciting one. Um, I think it was a connection through Sarah, actually. Um, it was well, Scott, I would say. Scott Shaw, who was... Um, the co-founder of Sutton was one of our first funders and believers in our program in terms of building out the mentorship and microloan program. And really, I think, I think just segueing into a little bit of advice in terms of mentorship or looking for a mentor, I think it's, you know, time and funds are equally as valuable and it really depends on what people um, have the capacity to give. So for the most part, when I first started with um, Scott as my mentor, who became a first funder, it was just really sitting down and learning um, and asking for advice. Uh, and then and then if there's interest and alignment in what the impact that the funder wants to make as well, then I think the, the funding comes like naturally after that. I think I answered your question. For the most you part. did. Yes. Thank you very much. And gave props. So that was very, very kind of you. Mm -hmm. yes. Jeff, how about you? How did your, your first sale for, let's, let's go with Claris, unless you want to talk about your other businesses. Uh, I'll use the other business as an example. Um, one of the lessons I've learned the hard way through years of product development is that my ideas are pretty much worthless. The only idea that matters is that, that a, a customer is willing to pay for. And I can't tell you the number of times I've been in front of customers desperately trying to sell them my thing and having very little in the way of interest from them. And my favorite story about that was uh, person running a lab in a hospital in England where I was in pitching a sample collection technology that we thought was the most brilliant thing that had ever been invented. This guy listened to our pitch and said, meh, not much interested. And then he pointed over in the corner of his lab and said, but if you can help me with this problem over here, I'd be really interested. And he showed us a problem with blood transfusion, which I won't get into, but it was incredibly easy for us to solve. And so we came back to him sometime later and said, well, what about this? And he bought it on the spot because that was what he asked for. My point here being that you need to do a lot of customer discovery before you make anything at all and talk to a lot of, you know, get yourself in front of the kind of customers that you're interested in. Get yourself in front of people who you may have a solution that can be modeled to what they want and ask them what their problems are. Ask them what they want. If you come back later, with a solution to their problem, they will buy it from you. It's not surprising. The really hard thing to do is to invent something that you know is completely out of your own head and then try to convince others that they should be as excited about it as you are. That's a hard way to do it. Very, very true. Uh, ben, I'm, I'm sorry, as soon as it's, um, as soon as we talk about uh, having something cool and figuring out how to make other people as excited about it. I know that communicating how cool your um, your technology is was something that uh, originally I remember you and being so excited about it in eye to eye. So do you mind talking a little bit about how you got your first? Absolutely. I mean, uh, we got our first customer in a sense years before uh, I started the company. I was at a conference and was talking with an entrepreneur in Australia and just chatting and he said that's remarkable and then went on all of the benefits that he saw with our materials which was entirely different than what i had envisaged 
<laughs> and you know they're customers to this day so that was i guess my very first customer uh, was just super motivated to see this in the world um and you know every customer we deal with major oems you know they're they're gradations of show me um some people can be convinced by technology but ultimately they want to see it in their hands and make devices that don't work and you have to say, hey, uh, here's a reference design or here, you know, at some level of their system humming along nicely, they'll believe you. And so uh, we pivoted as an organization to be more of a show me. So we make devices, we show that this full system works and our material sitting in it is critical for enhanced performance. And uh, yeah, as we engage with more and more customers, they become more and more show me because the, the super excited ones, uh, I think we've gone through that. That's fantastic. And Farah, do you mind talking about yours, your first customer? Yeah, mine is actually a very similar story, Jeff's. I actually went to the clients that actually SFB Venture Connections was one of my first clients. And I offered to just do a workshop for free for them just because I really wanted to see what they had thought of it. What, you know, did they find it useful? Did they find it helpful? So I think it's really important to actually go out there and talk to your potential customers and see if it's even working, if that product or service is what they are looking for. And that actually led me to then working with WorkBC, which led me to a couple of other contracts. So um, yeah, go out there, put your product or service out there first with the customers that you want to approach and just see if they like it or not. And they will be honest, they'll give you their feedback, so. That is fantastic advice. This has been, this has been so much fun and so inspiring. And I wanted to reiterate to the audience out there, we've got people from all different backgrounds, all different programs working on really significant challenges that are making a significant impact in the world. So if you can listen to customers and marry that to your passions, um, if they match, it might be time for our audience to think about taking that leap that our panelists have done into the world of entrepreneurship and also to be compassionate with yourself along the way and to be honest um, with your community and to seek out all that support that's available. Um, and most of the people here uh, are part of the SFU community uh, and which means that you can access this um, amazing support structure that we've created here, uh, including the, if you're a student and are interested in programming, the uh, Chang Institute for Entrepreneurship, web sfu.ca slash Chang Institute. Uh, if you are a alumni, staff, faculty, um, anyone, or have a co-founder who is one of those things, Venture Connection is open, Venture Labs, our later stage incubators open to um, the whole community, and uh, Radius, our social innovation lab, is also available to people solving challenges in the community. So there's tons of support available to you and everyone is happy to help. I see that we have the uh, LinkedIn from all of our panelists going up in that chat. Um, and so when people say, remember when people say that they want you to reach out, they mean it. Uh, so I hope that this has been inspiring and has given you some directions to go forward. And I want to once more thank the, first thank the organizers, uh, Gwenda, Natalia, Tony, um, Shauna uh, for putting all this together and inviting me to uh, help inspire and showcase these amazing people. And thank you so much to our panelists for spending the afternoon and evening with us. So I would, I would, can't, the only downside of Zoom is I can't get the whole audience clapping, but I'm sure that around the, uh, around the city, there's lots of clapping going on. So thank you guys so much for, for everything. Thank you so much, Sarah, and to our expert panelists today. I hope everybody has a lovely evening and uh, we are going to stick around. So if there's any additional questions you want addressed, we will stick around with our panelists. Otherwise, thank you, everybody. A uh, big thank you to Sarah for moderating the conversation today and uh, getting us inspired. So have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you so much.